Hey guys, so you want to become a data analyst in 2022? Well, you come to the right place. I'm here to show you exactly how to do it along with a full roadmap. As you can see, we got it on the screen right now. It's really long. It's so long, it doesn't even load quickly. We have all this content to go over, so let's go ahead and get started. There are going to be three major sections of this video. The first section is going to go over the various starting points and the fastest way to become a data analyst from each of those starting points. The second part is going to be about defining the type of job you want. I feel like this is a part of becoming a data analyst that a lot of people, a lot of people don't cover that's really, really important, so we're going to be covering that as well. And the third part is going to be the skill set roadmap to become a data analyst, quite honestly, what you're here for. But before we get started, I actually wanted to highlight today's, uh, today's video sponsor, DataCamp. Thank you so much for DataCamp for sponsoring this video. Uh, it was actually just a complete coincidence. I was planning on putting out this video. DataCamp reached out to me, and they wanted to sponsor the video. And actually, it makes perfect sense. DataCamp is an online, uh, not quite boot camp, but it's an online service that allows you to start learning for free. Um, and they have lessons in everything from statistics to Excel to Python to R to SQL and a lot of stuff that even my videos don't cover. And actually, one of the things I really like about DataCamp is that you're able to practice what you learn directly in the video. So if you watch my videos, you'll know that we have uh, I have some some like practice in the videos themselves. But given that they are videos and I don't have like an interactive software suite that you can use, there isn't much opportunity for you to practice. Probably the best example is my SQL stuff, where I get questions a lot from people of how do you practice SQL. Well, there's a limited number of websites. To do that and data camp is one of the ones that i would recommend so thank you so much to data camp for sponsoring this video if you want to try out data camp for free you get access to the first chapter of every um skill tree for free go ahead and click on the link in the description below and uh you support my channel and it uh, can help you uh, become a data analyst yourself so without further ado let's go ahead and get started and thank you for to data camp for sponsoring this video all right so let us go ahead and talk about the framework um so you'll see over here, I have it in PDF format. It also comes in a PNG, and it comes in a draw.io format. If you're interested in that as well, you can edit it for your own liking. If you want to get access to this, um, there is another link in the description below that you can go ahead and click. And if you click on that link, then it takes you to, see if I can find it. Whoops, not the right one. It takes you to my Gumroad. I decided to just put it up on Gumroad, which is just a website where you can put stuff on and people can pay for them. The, it, the skill roadmap is completely free. All you have to do is go to the Gumroad and just put in zero and say, I want this, and then uh, go ahead and put in an email address. If you don't want to give your real ad uh, email address, I just put in spam at mailinator.com and it goes to one of these public inboxes. You can download it from there. But I just want to give you guys the opportunity to contribute to the, to the channel in a one-time manner because I know I have my Patreon, but in a one-time manner if you guys were interested. So completely free. You can download the PDF, the PNG, and the uh, draw.io file if you're interested in using that. So go ahead and download it and follow along with me. So let's go ahead and get started first with starting points. So before, and I guess, you know, even before that, what I do want to go over one thing is a couple of caveats that I have in this. Um, I'm just one person and my experience is very limited to like my life experience and the people that surround me, the people I'm able to interact with. So one thing I'll say is my work experience has been entirely in the United States. I have a lot of international viewers um, and thank you guys so much for the support you guys offer. It's uh, what helps help this channel grow. Uh, that being said, I am based in the United States. I've only worked in the United States and almost everyone I know has worked in the US. Even uh, a lot of my cousins who are from India came and got jobs in the US. So. Uh, that's just a grain of salt to remember whenever you listen to anything that I'm saying in any of my videos. Second is almost everyone I know has a college education. I uh, get a couple of people on my YouTube channel and on my live streams who ask, what do you do if you don't have a college education? And I'm going to try and give the best uh, overview I can over here, but I need to make it very clear. I personally have a college education. I have a bachelor's in chemistry and uh, everyone I know has a college education as well. So I will be the first to tell you, I may not be the best person to discuss that with you, but I will try my best to help you out. And then second, this is a generalized roadmap that's supposed to help you determine the steps that make more sense for you on your journey into analytics. As with most goals, uh, how you should approach getting a job in analytics will have a lot to do with where you started. So that's kind of why I wanted to start the roadmap off with uh, kind of like the five major starting points I saw with uh, people. I actually asked on my YouTube community, there's a poll I had kind of where I asked people, here are four starting points that I have. Is there anything else that I'm missing? Uh, out of everything that was suggested over there, I actually didn't see anything that I couldn't like, you know, kind of sequester into these different categories over here. So let's just go ahead and discuss what we're, what's going on over here. So uh, I, the way I see it, you could either be pursuing a degree, you could already have a degree and are searching for a job, you could be working in some kind of a, a corporate company right now, um, or working in some kind of a job right now. Uh, you could have no degree and have no intent of getting one. 
and you could have a relevant degree and the appropriate technical skills. Someone commented that they already knew everything that I was suggesting over here, um, in which case I would just say, you know, just apply more, quite honestly. There's nothing else to it. But if you're pursuing a degree, I think that the uh, fastest way to get into analytics for you and the best next steps you can take are to obtain relevant degrees and internships. So uh, if you're a junior in college, third year, uh, that's what we call third years in the US, you it might be a little bit late to switch out your degree. And I am personally not too much in favor of the idea of spending a lot more money and more time in college than you need to. Because oftentimes what you'll find out is for a lot of positions, after you get that first job, if you can get into that first job, no one cares about your degree afterwards, which is why uh, if you're really late in college, I would not suggest switching out switching out your degree path. But if you're early enough to be uh, determining what degree you want, then any degree in mathematics, uh, preferably statistics, uh, computer science, engineering, or data science, apparently data science degrees exist at the bachelor's level these days. These are the degrees that are going to stick out the most to an HR recruiter um, at a company that you might be applying to. Second, let's say you have a degree and are searching. So when I was looking for a job, this is the position that I was in. I graduated with a degree in chemistry. I didn't really know all that much. Um, and I didn't have a relevant degree, quite honestly. And so if you don't have a relevant degree, don't worry. I have a, I have a degree in chemistry. Uh, and if you look at the chart below, you'll see the skills you need to build. We'll get to that in a second. And you can start tackling them one after another and start applying as soon as you can. Remember, the only way to get to get a job is to actually apply for it. So what I would tell you is start building out some of the skills below and consistently apply. Um, what you're really looking for is a lucky break of a company that's willing to give you a shot. And a lot of them are. There is There are not nearly enough people who are willing to do analytics in America today uh, for the jobs that are available. So keep, uh, keep that in mind when you're looking through jobs. Third is say you're already working a job. What I recommend to people in this position is to internally transfer. If you can, if, if your company has analytics positions, um, you can get, you can avoid a lot of HR, whoops, you can avoid a lot of problems with trying to deal with HR at another company by internally transferring within your own company, getting a job at, uh, getting another job within the company you're already in. Find a team that you'd like to work for um, and request a meeting with the manager and ask them what you would need to do in order to become a data analyst on their team. Look on the internal jobs portal if you have one and build a relationship with a recruiter who can help you get into a job. Recruiters have backlogs of jobs. They're, they're constantly trying to fill. So having a vetted internal candidate such as yourself is always appreciated by them. One other thing I would say is that at... Um, Nordstrom, we have these things called ERGs, Employee Resource Groups. Um, I think that's what it stands for. But basically, they're groups that are designed for like specific, um, I think they're all minorities, right? Because there's like an Asian one, there's like a black one, there's a Hispanic one. Um, and so what happens is they're basically Slack threads and a uh, people will usually post jobs there first. I think the idea is that they want to get uh, people uh, in racial minorities and we want to like make sure that as many people are applying to these jobs as possible and are like aware that these jobs exist. That way the most qualified candidate actually gets into the job because uh, a lot of the issues people have with getting jobs is that they're just not aware that they exist. So if you're, if you have like internal, like you might have an internal Slack channel in your company that you might want to look into. That's just what Nordstrom does. We have our ERGs. And there are other methods that you can like look for jobs internally. Next, this is going to be the hardest one. Say you have no degree and no intent to get one. And when I say no intent to get one, I mean like, you know, it might be too expensive. You might be at an age where it doesn't make sense for you to do it. Um, you might have kids and it's extremely difficult for you to do that. So um, what I would say over here, right, and don't mistake this, there is no silver bullet. Um, and that's, that's one thing I should make clear with this whole roadmap. There is no silver bullet. The Google Data Analytics Certificate is a great way to center your learning. And Google says, now how true this is, no one actually knows, but Google says that the Google Data Analytics Certificate can be seen as a bachelor's degree by Google and a select few other companies. I would say that's a great first step, not a silver bullet, but a great first step towards pushing yourself, like trying to push your way into this industry. If you are in this position, you have your work cut out for you. You can totally do it. I've seen people do it, but you have your work cut out for you. This is the hardest position to break into the field from, and you'll have to work harder than most other candidates to get in. Don't worry though, the Google Data Analytics Certificate was created for candidates like yourself, and it teaches a lot of the necessary skills in order to become a data analyst and can be used in lieu of a bachelor's degree in some companies. Additionally, if you have work experience, this is really important. Don't discount on your work experience and try to find ways to talk about how you've always been an analytical person in your job interviews, no matter how true it is or not. Um, Great example, let's say, for example, you worked at a plumbing business, right? 
And uh, the way a lot of plumbers work in the U.S. is that they get like a list of jobs in the morning and they're dispatched to go do these jobs one after another. Maybe you used an Excel spreadsheet and a couple of Excel skills to actually manage your jobs and be like, okay, I know that, you know, fixing this water spout will probably take this long. Fixing that will take that long. And you're able to use that to more accurately get yourself dispatched and maybe recommend to your dispatcher, hey, it's probably a better idea I take care of this job versus that, that job right now. The point I'm making is there there is room in almost every job available to be an analytical person. And if you have been working a job that is not like not as a data analyst, you probably have done something somewhere where you were working as an analytical person. Really dig into that and talk about your experience. That's your competitive advantage against a college graduate. Uh, college is great and all, but I find that um, experience can also teach people a lot. And I think People have learned more about, more in their lives than they think they have if they just really think about it and absorb that information and are cognizant of what they're actually learning. So um, difficult position to be in, not at all impossible, and best of luck to you. Um, and this kind of goes back to that second caveat. I don't think I'm the absolute best person to talk about like what to do without a college education because it's not a position I was ever in myself. Um, and you know, it's, it's like one of those things you can't even simulate. Like, you know, I mean, I guess I could take my college education like off my resume, but um, you know, I, I just don't think I'm the, uh, I'm, I may not be the absolute best candidate to talk about that. And then the final position is you have a relevant degree and you have all the appropriate technical skills. Um, I actually got suggested this in one of the comments below where someone was saying that they knew everything already, basically. Um, apply more. That just means you have to apply more and more and more. We're not going to spend too much time on that. Okay, so next I want to go over defining the actual type of job you want. So this is something that I don't think anyone talks about enough, um, but I have talk to so i was super lucky to get into what i feel like to accidentally fall into what i feel like is a very desirable path of jobs one after another um and i was super lucky that it just worked out for me and i'm also incredibly lucky that my dad has worked in corporate america his entire life so he was able to tell me this type of job is generally better than that type of job you don't want to be in that position because you can't get promoted from there uh, and that wisdom was very helpful for me when i was deciding what jobs i should take and what jobs i shouldn't take i got offered a uh job at a startup as and, and they gave me the title of data scientist but they were going to pay me sixty thousand dollars a year and at uh, that time i was making sixty three thousand dollars a year I will say $60,000 a year for the title of a data scientist is a very low salary um, in the United States. Uh, it was a startup based in a foreign country, so I can kind of understand why they were doing that. But it was that plus they wouldn't offer me like a laptop. They wouldn't give me like basic like work peripherals. They're like, we'll give it to you after six months. My dad said that's a major red flag. Um, at the end of the day, a company should provide every like you're making the company money. That's your job. The company should provide you all of the necessary tools in order to do that. A data scientist needs a laptop. So these are the kinds of things that uh, I'm very lucky to have my dad who was able to tell me, hey, it's Shashank, like, that doesn't make much sense. And that's kind of what I want to go over over here. I want to I cover that wisdom over here. So I would say that there are basically three major dimensions that you can split up a um, what type of job you get. So first of all, let's go over employee type. So the question is, what type of employee are you? Are You can either be a full-time employee, a part-time employee, or a contractor. Now... What I recommend to most people getting into an industry for the first time is to become a full-time employee because as a full-time employee, you get full benefits, um, especially in America, it's really important that you get healthcare um, as part of your job, um, more job security, uh, even in uh, what so-called right-to-work states. Um, in the United States, there's this concept of a right-to-work state. I think Texas is one of them. Basically, in the state of Texas, you can fire employees for almost any reason instantly, um, obviously non-discriminatory reasons. But even in right-to-work states, because of... Um, uh, the propensity to be sued for wrongful termination, companies are generally careful about who they are like about firing people, especially their full-time employees. Um, of course, it's, you're, you know, this isn't like a magic shield or anything. It doesn't prevent you from getting fired ever. I'm just saying as a full-time employee of these three positions, they're probably the hardest to fire. And so you get job security and because you get job security and because hiring people takes a, you know, the general wisdom is it takes like one and a half times the salary to hire someone basically, uh, because hiring someone takes so much time, companies will want to invest. They're more likely to want to invest in you as a full-time employee. And to me, that's the biggest benefit of being a full-time employee versus being a part-time employee or a contractor. Companies will want to invest in you. And and that's really what I think is important to, uh, that's one thing you want to get out of a job. You want a company that's willing to invest in you and in your growth. So that's why I recommend becoming a full-time employee. Part-time employees, one good thing about this is that this can be a great way to break into the industry. Um, you'll get less money, fewer benefits, uh, but a better work-life balance. So say, for example, maybe, excuse me, say, for example, maybe you um, have been out of the industry for 10 years, you have a kid and everything, and you don't want to go like whole hog 
you know, 40 hours a week immediately. Uh, a part-time job might be a great way to get started in the industry and to pick up some skills in a uh, environment that is more respectful of your work-life balance. So, um, in most cases, I wouldn't recommend part-time, but you know, it, it might work out for you. Another thing to uh, consider with a part-time employee is you may not get benefits that may or may not be important to you, depending on uh, whether your spouse or someone else is working and you can go off of their benefits. And then finally, contractor. Uh, contractors, easy to hire, easy to fire. Contract work is a good way to get started, but I argue unless you actively want to be a contractor, say on Upwork or something, you should convert this position into a full-time employee as soon as possible. Companies typically don't invest in their contractors and actually, actually they actively keep their contractors away from corporate events because um, there is a risk in certain states that if you like kind of pretend a contract, if you treat a contractor like a full-time employee, they can sue you and become a full-time employee or something like that. They're, like Google had this problem a couple of years ago where uh, they won't even let contractors take like t-shirts from the campus because they're like, no, you are not a full-time employee. You are a contractor. Uh, as a side note, it is possible to get paid a bit more um, as a contractor uh, in exchange for the instability of the job. So um, I have a family member and she actually chooses to be a contractor from job to job because she makes a lot more money doing it. And she's able to get money. Uh, she's sorry. She's able to get benefits from her spouse. So the, the benefits part doesn't really matter for her. And she's able to get more money as a contractor. Um, and that is why I would not recommend becoming a contractor unless you really know what you're doing. Or if you become a contractor, convert that into a full-time job. The reason I go over this is because I have people come to me asking me for advice, and that's something that they don't consider. That is really, really important. If you want, you want to make sure you don't just get into the field of analytics, but that you get a good job. Next, uh, I would say you have job type. And uh, the way I see it, there are one, two, three, four, five kind of like major job types that I've experienced in the world of analytics. This, this is kind of like my personal breakdown of it. It's, there's, it's not really, I wouldn't call this like super objective or anything. It really is my opinion. So first you have consulting, then industry, tech, startup, and nonprofit. So consulting companies like Ernst & Young, so EY, Deloitte, Bain & Company, you'll work with many different unrelated projects and leave with a stamp of approval from a well-respected corporation. That's kind of what these are. And, and they're like smaller consulting firms that aren't just like these like, you know, big four consulting firms. Um, these guys bring in tons of people every single year. One great thing about joining a company like this right out of graduation is that you'll be joining a group of maybe, a, I don't know, like a thousand other um, people who join like all as part of like the class of 2017 or the class of 2018 into the consulting world of that time. So consulting is a interesting job type. Um, and one that I would recommend. It's not, it's not the route that I went. And it's now that I'm more advanced in my career, I don't think I would go into consulting, but, uh, it is a great job type and a great way to get started. Cause you'll see a huge gamut of industries and companies, and you'll work with different clients and see different things. And, uh, you can leave with the stamp of approval from, from a well-respected institution. Um, and I would say one of the best things about working at consulting companies is that the people that come from these companies, they know how to structure out projects really, really well because they have to, they have to, right? Cause they have to go from client to client and be able to immediately put everything together in some kind of a structure that helps them understand what problems are going on and how to solve them. Next is industry. Now, industry is kind of like the word consultants use to refer to people like myself. Um, so I am a full-time employee. I'm a senior data analyst at Nordstrom and uh, Nordstrom is a North American major fashion retailer. And companies like Nordstrom, Toyota, and other non-tech, non-consulting companies, I'm calling those industry right now. Uh, these are normal companies, you know, quote unquote, uh, and the jobs can range uh, in quality from poor to very good. So industry is kind of like a catch-all term for a bunch of different jobs uh, or a bunch of different companies. And you can get really crappy jobs in the industry or you can get really good jobs. So I feel very lucky that I actually have a very good job. Uh, Nordstrom being in Seattle is willing to invest in their tech workers, of which they count data analysts as a part of. Next is tech. I've separated out tech. Uh, and when I mean when I say tech, I mean stuff like big tech. Um, so Facebook, Google, or Meta, Google, Stripe, Netflix, uh, these types of companies. And the reason I separate them out is because they tend to compensate their data analysts significantly better um, and have more mature tech implementations. And many uh, quote unquote industry companies also have tech branches like uh, Woven Capital, which is Toyota's tech branch um, or Walmart Labs for Walmart. And these are typically, these jobs of these like five classifications of jobs are typically the hardest to get. So I would say like, if you work in tech, uh, you will get uh, compensated very well, like both monetarily and through stock. One of the major benefits of these types of jobs is that the stock you get is in a company whose stock value is probably gonna go up for the next 10 to 20 years. So. Um, in, in industry, for example, right? Like you can go to an industry company and get stock in those companies, but 
a lot of industry companies, the stock is not like a straight word, straight trajectory up. Uh, of course, there are some that are like, for example, Costco. Costco is an amazing stock, keeps going up, great business, very well run. Um, but tech, you know, you have great compensation packages. That's kind of why I separated it out. A lot of people want to go into tech and a lot of YouTubers will talk about tech or because they worked at Facebook for like two years, they, you know, kind of start an entire, an entire YouTube channel about it. Um, no shade, just saying that these aren't the only jobs out there. There are many other jobs available too, but these are probably the most monetarily desirable jobs out there. Uh, startups, so newer, less established companies. Job security is not as high. Salaries tend to be lower, but you can make significantly you can make a significantly greater difference in your organization and might be able to get equity in your job. So startups are companies where you will not get paid as much typically, unless it's a very well funded startup or you're coming in as as a very specialized graduate. Um, so you'll get paid less, you might get equity, um, but probably the biggest thing about it is that you will get the opportunity to make a significantly bigger difference because you're going to be part of a smaller group of employees. And actually there was a company I was interviewing with at the time I was interviewing with Nordstrom and, uh, that's exactly what they said. They basically said like, you're going, I was telling them about my, about my Nordstrom offer and they said, we can't offer you as much as Nordstrom offers you, but you'll get to make a much bigger impact over here. And the, you know, what job you decide to take is an entirely personal decision. Um, I would say there are very few cases where there's like an objectively better decision than uh, another because a great benefit of a startup is that by making a bigger impact, you can learn a lot more and you might get promoted way faster and end up making more money, uh, not today, but like, you know, maybe in a year or two. So this is something to consider when you're looking at, you're looking at startups. Uh, and then nonprofits, uh, low pay, hard work, um, but can be much more rewarding if you're into that. That's not me putting down nonprofits. It's just kind of like, it, it's the name of the game, right? If your job is not to make a profit, you're not going to offer your employees the best salaries at all. I, through my consulting gig, I have worked with people in, non, in uh, nonprofits um, and it, it is hard work. The pay is not that great. And, um, but you could be making a real difference in people's lives. The start, the uh, nonprofit I worked with, what they were doing was making a really big difference in people's lives, and it was very, very respectable work. So um, you go home every single day with a clean conscience versus a lot of other like corporate jobs. Oftentimes, uh, you know, depending on the type of person you are, people might leave their job every day kind of being like, what's the point of all this? Why am I doing any of this? Which contributes to burnout, in my opinion. In my opinion, burnout, like there's a bunch of different things that contribute to burnout. And then one of them is a feeling of uh, the lack of importance of your job. Because I feel like everyone is more than okay working hard, but they have to feel like they're working hard for something worthwhile. So that's just my opinion on the five different job types over there. And then finally, industry. And then industry in this case, in this context, refers to the primary business of the company you're working at. So for example, Toyota works in automobiles, Nordstrom in fashion retail, and ExxonMobil in oil and gas. Contrary to what Michael Scott says, there are many different types of industries and they almost all need data analysts. Um, anyone that's an office fan will, will get that joke. All right. So now let's get to what you came here for. The roadmap to become a data analyst. You'll see there's tons of content over here. You're going to learn a lot. I, I really hope so. This is me condensing. I'm trying to make the most detailed video on how to become a data analyst on YouTube right now. So um, hopefully this works. And again, remember, this is based off of my experience. I have talked to other people about this, um, but remember, this is based on my experience. And any, any advice you get from anyone is based on their experience, you know, so just as a heads up. Uh, certain things to consider. So I've kind of broken this up into different stages and uh, different colors over here. So when you see this legend over here, right? Green skills, I consider necessary. Orange, I consider highly recommended. And purple, I consider uh, completely optional. Um, why I didn't use red over here, if you've watched my previous live streams, comment below why I didn't use red. Um, you know, you'd think it would be green, orange, red. Why didn't I use red? Let me know below. Uh, so we start off with stage nulla. So I found out that um, I was using Roman numerals over here, right? So you see like one, two, three. Uh, nulla apparently means zero in, in Latin. So I, I just call it stage nulla. So you'll see, let's back up a little bit. This is roughly in order going from left to right, top down of when you should be doing stuff. But obviously tailor this to what makes the most sense for you. But starting off at stage zero, stage zero consists of tasks and objectives that can take years to develop and aren't available to everyone. So a great example of this is getting a relevant bachelor's degree. Um, one thing is if you want to become a data analyst, a in the United States, a master's degree should not be necessary. Um, I do know some people who after their master's degree, because they had no relevant work experience, they became data analysts, but then quickly got promoted into data scientist roles. So um, if you're a master's degree student you become a data and you want to become a data scientist, don't uh, fret too much. Maybe becoming, becoming a data analyst is like your path upwards. 
So stage nulla objective. These are tasks slash objectives that can take years to develop and aren't available to everyone. If you are able to, then you should try and achieve these objectives here, but they aren't necessary. So like great examples are uh, getting a bachelor's degree. So for example, I have a bachelor's degree in chemistry. That was not at all a relevant degree. And I would, I would say broadly speaking, like I graduated with a degree in chemistry, going back and getting a bachelor's degree in computer science, which is not an option for me because of how expensive college is over here. I was heavily in debt after leaving college and there there is probably no way I could have afforded to go back and get a bachelor's degree. Um, and I'm glad I didn't too, because I was able to just get a job. And instead of paying to learn, I was learning and getting paid at the same time at my first job. So if you decide to get a, a bachelor's degree, remember engineering, statistics, data science, and mathematics, those are probably the most relevant degrees to get in reference to like getting a job as a data analyst. Next, uh, data science slash data analyst internships. Um, if you're able to snag internships while in college, if you're in college, look for internships. These will be your golden ticket into an opportunity in a job in analytics. They can be very easy, or sorry, they can very easily be more important than your actual degree. Look for data science internships if you can. Aim high as you have nothing to lose at this stage and an internship at a major company can lead to a job offer in the future. Almost everyone I know that works in Facebook or something or like one of the fan companies, they had an internship there prior. And almost everyone I know who kind of got their career jump started right after college, it was it really wasn't their education. Um, I mean, obviously getting a degree from, you know, as you can tell I'm from Emory University, getting a degree from Emory was like helpful. Like it did put them in like a different kind of bucket of students, but it's the internships that they talked about in their interviews and that the uh, hiring managers actually cared about. So internships, when you go to college, I would say that's kind of your, your like golden ticket. Doesn't mean let go of your grades. I'm just saying that's your golden ticket. And then finally, data science boot camps. Um, these can be good for people who might need the structure of a classroom in order to more effectively learn. Be careful though, because, uh, because of the big backlash against the cost of education, a bunch of people started creating data science boot camps, and some of them are like eighteen to twenty thousand dollars. And I'm like, God dang, man, that's like that that's half the cost of a college education. Um, and like the boot camps, like I don't know, maybe like twelve weeks or something. Um, not saying that just because something is expensive, it's not worth it. I'm just saying be very careful about where you spend your money. When it comes to education, um, again, you could spend a lot of money and get a great education. It could totally be worth it. Some, I'm not bagging on education. I'm just saying that because education is such a squishy thing to measure, it's hard to measure like what's the actual benefit of this. Because it's such a squishy thing to measure, there people have every incentive to take you for a ride and take all your money and offer you very little value. So do your research. Make sure that the boot camp you uh, go to offers a job guarantee and make Make sure that the boot camp you go to, if you decide to go to one, um, is a um, make sure the boot camp that you go to is a highly recommended boot camp. And actually, I'm going to change this to be um, purple. This shouldn't be orange. I apologize for this being orange. This is going to be purple over here. Uh, but these two are highly recommended if you can do it. I don't highly recommend a boot camp. I think a boot camp might be right for you, but it really depends on you. So, data science boot camp that'll be purple. All right, so now let's get to kind of like the actual skills that I can teach you uh, through my YouTube channel. So let's go ahead and start off with stage one. So stage one objective, gain a basic understanding of how to manipulate data using a graphical user interface. So um, we have two major skills over here that I think you should learn, a BI tool and Excel. In stage one, you want to learn these two things first. So BI stands for business intelligence and talks about a class of tools that help users organize a large amount of data and then present it to users in a typically visual manner. Examples include Tableau, Power BI, and MicroStrategy. Why should you learn this? So these tools are built to be easy to understand, but powerful enough to enable advanced data operations like joins, unions, uh, stuff like that. Even fuzzy matching and stuff is available in some of these tools. With relatively little effort, you can quickly bring advanced insights to your business stakeholders and kind of, you know, story time. When I started, obviously, I had a degree in chemistry, and you know, degree in chemistry, I didn't learn any of the stuff, and I didn't have any skills going into the workplace that were actually useful for what I was trying to do. But I got started in Tableau, and Tableau was relatively easy for me to learn, and because it was easy for me to learn, I was able to bring some really great insights to the company in a relatively small amount of time. And I was lucky enough that, like, at my company, Tableau was kind of a new thing for them, so I was one of the first guys to get on it. But um, that is something to remember. Tableau allows you, Tableau Power BI; these tools allow you to punch way above your weight. And if you want to learn one of these BI tools, I have a free Tableau class right over here. If you click on link right over here, then you'll see it transports you to the 
actual video I have on my YouTube channel, or you can go ahead and click on that link as well. Um, so go ahead and try that out. This is my resource. This is the first video I made on my YouTube channel, and it is Tableau in three hours with a free workbook. It teaches you how to use Tableau to a much better extent than I did when I joined uh, my first company. So if you want to learn Tableau, check it out over here. If you want to learn Power BI, Power BI is a great tool. And if you want to know which one you should learn, right? In my opinion, if you have time, learn both. If you don't, uh, go onto the, the nearest job board in the location you want to get a job in. See which one is more popular in your location. Some states or in some cities, Power BI is more popular. In some cities, Tableau is more popular. Neither is definitively more popular than the other one because it's so geographically based. Because say Power BI is more popular in New York, but Tableau is more popular in Dallas. Well, if I'm looking for jobs in Dallas, it doesn't matter to me that Power BI is more popular in New York. So look and see which one makes the most sense for you to learn. And that's kind of one thing I want to go over with this entire roadmap. The idea of a roadmap, um, I, I don't like the word roadmap because a roadmap implies that like, you can, or you know what, this is probably what it is. It is a roadmap. It's not a GPS. A GPS tells you what is objectively the best route for you to take. A roadmap lays out all of the paths in front of you, and you need to decide which route makes the most sense to take based on your own analysis. So this is a roadmap, and that's the way you should see it. Think of it as a roadmap, but not a GPS. I'm not telling you exactly what to do in what order that is most optimal for you, because that would be literally impossible. What I'm telling you is here are a set of skills that I find particularly useful. And, you know, I do hire data analysts um, as part, like, you know, I'm, I'm one of the interviewers. Uh, and uh, at my company for data analysts. And these are my recommendations as to like the skills I find particularly useful to have people see. So if you wanna learn Power BI, right? You can go ahead and do Microsoft's resource right over here or DataCamp, you know, the sponsor of this video. They have, um, excuse me, they have a great introduction to Power BI as well. Um, I don't have a video on Power BI. I only have a video on Tableau. If you wanna learn Tableau, you got my resource right over there. Completely free, YouTube video. Next is Excel. So Excel is a data manipulation tool and it's used by almost all companies all over the world. Google Sheets is a great alternative though, but at least in the United States, Microsoft Excel is like the standard. Um, usually smaller companies and startups are the ones that use Google Sheets. But if your company has a finance department, they probably swear by Excel. And because of that, you, probably, you guys probably have an Excel license. So although Excel is generally not used for managing very large amounts of data, I use Excel almost every day to quickly analyze data using pivot tables and VLOOKUPs and formatting it in a method that's easy for stakeholders to absorb. Excel is great for ad hoc analyses, but be careful of investing too much time into Excel as advanced data teams usually don't use it for most operations. What I mean by this is um, things like macros, um, I, uh, what, what is it called? Um, uh, VB something. There's like, a, there's like a coding language behind Excel you can also use. Um, I wouldn't invest too much time into that stuff. Learn VLOOKUPs, learn pivot tables, um, you know, a couple keyboard shortcuts. Just become proficient, like, like basic, like I'd, I'd call it like mid-level proficient at Excel. And that's really all you need to know. Uh, and because I don't think you have to know much Excel to become a data analyst, I don't actually have a resource um, for Excel though. I don't know, maybe, maybe I'll create one since it's um, the level of skill is not too high. And again, Microsoft has a great tutorial on how to use Excel and uh, DataCamp does as well. All right, so after you've learned these two things, right? I'm a huge be a believer in you, if you don't use it, you'll lose it. So you gotta make sure that you actually use these skills in order to ensure that you actually remember what you've learned and can continue um, and can actually execute on what you've learned in a workplace. You might be like asked to like, do this in a interview to show them you know Tableau. Um, when I joined Nordstrom, one of the technical interviews they gave me was a Tableau interview. I had to make a dashboard in front of the interviewer. And that was, um, you know, it's good that I was using it regularly because I was able to easily execute on that. So now that you have some proper technical skills in the form of a BI tool and some decent Excel knowledge, you can go ahead and demonstrate your knowledge in the form of a project. Both Tableau and Power BI both have free versions of their software that you can use in order to bring some life to an otherwise boring data set. I always recommend gathering your own data if you can, but if you don't have the time to do this, then go to data.gov or kaggle.com. Both are great websites to download clean and interesting data sets. Visualize something, publish it online, you've practiced and you can show it to, uh, you've practiced so you won't forget the skills and you can show that practice to a interviewer that might be interviewing you. All right, so we finished stage one and we finished your first project. Now what do you do? Well, let's see. Oh, now what I would say is you can start applying to jobs. So actually, let's go over here. So you'll see over here where it says apply to jobs. That is available to you now. And after you finish the green skills in stage one, you should actively start applying to jobs. It can take companies up to three months to respond to you, even if they want you. The earlier you can start putting in applications, generally the better. So it took Nordstrom a couple of months to actually get back to me. Um, 
and, and you know, I ended up getting a job there. So that's kind of my advice is uh, companies can take a while to respond to you, especially if you're in an off season like winter. Uh, and so start applying as soon as you have some skills. In my, in my opinion, after your project one, that's kind of when you can start applying to jobs because you'll have some actual skills to speak of and you'll be able to talk about something if, say, you get an interview immediately. So when applying to jobs, right, there are a couple of things you need to remember. The first thing you need to do is build out your resume. Skillful resume building is a cornerstone of your application and watch my video here in order to understand what makes a good resume. I'm not going to go into too much detail about it because, you know, I got the video right over there. I have the ultimate resume guide. You can check it out over there by clicking on this button right over here. Okay, networking, the dreaded domain for many. Networking doesn't have to mean trying to make small talk with random people at job fairs. That's not what it has to mean. Oftentimes, you'll find that people you have met earlier in life through college or high school might be able to get your application directly to a recruiter at a company. Don't be afraid to reach out. And I found out that people that I haven't talked to since middle school are more than willing to help me out by recommending me to a uh, for a job. There was I was applying for jobs um, a couple of years ago, and there was a job I wanted at IBM. Uh, I, I didn't get it, but uh, there was a job I wanted at IBM. And the there was a girl I saw on LinkedIn who I had not talked to since middle school. She was super nice to me in middle school. She was she's just one of those people that's like just a very nice person. Um, uh, and I don't mean that as in like a nice, I don't know anything else to say about her, but I mean, she's like just a genuinely nice person. So I, uh, have not seen her since middle school. I see that she works on uh, IBM and I know that because I'm on LinkedIn, LinkedIn, best friend. Um, and so what happens is I, uh, message her on LinkedIn. I say, Hey, can I like get a recommendation for the job? She's like, yeah, hit me up at my number. Let's call. And usually they want to just talk to just make sure that, you know, there's some basic level of competency in like what you're talking about. So, um, don't be afraid to reach out. People are want people understand the struggle people who have jobs um a lot of them understand the struggle of getting jobs so people are more than willing to help and networking doesn't mean it doesn't have to mean making small talk at job fairs it can mean also just reaching out to your network and say you don't have like friends who are in like nice corporate jobs maybe one of their dads or their brothers or their mothers or their sisters isn't a nice corporate job uh, you know people's families can be another great way to get some help so something i highly recommend Next is interview prep, interview prep. So very few people are naturally good at interviewing, which is why interview prep is an important part of becoming a data analyst. You can usually do this after you've already scheduled your, your interview. So you know, you'll apply, submit your resume, they'll get back to you, they'll give you a phone screen, and then you'll prep for your interview. And to see some of my tips on the general interview process, along with Nick Singh, the author of How to Ace the Data Scientist Interview, check out this video below. Um, it was a great interview. It was a lot of fun. Nick Singh's a really cool guy. Excuse me. And in that video, we have all kinds of advice on how to successfully apply for a job in analytics. And then apply, apply, and apply again. This can easily be the most frustrating part of an application process. Just know that many people, including myself, have had to apply to dozens of companies before we got through the door. I had to apply to over 80 companies before getting to um, uh, two interviews, one of which landed my current job. So... Don't be afraid if you have to apply a bunch. Um, obviously, you know, the intention is you eventually get to a, a level of skill where you don't have to apply a bunch. But I mean, you know, even I had to apply like 80 times before I got this job. So something to be aware of. And then one of the most talented guys I know, he wanted to work at a major car manufacturer. And he uh, was working at a non-car manufacturer job earlier, but there was a specific one he wanted to work for. And so every single Saturday he would get up because that's when they like refresh their job listings on their website. And he would apply to all the relevant jobs he could every single Saturday. He applied to dozens of jobs by then, and now he is a manager at this major car manufacturer doing some really cool stuff there. So, you know, it's uh, that, that's part of the grind as well, you know? And at the end of the day, becoming a data analyst, like this is all gonna be a grind for a bit. Obviously, you know, you don't wanna grind forever, but it's gonna be a grind for a bit. Um, but just know we all went through it and I'm here to support you. All right, so now let's go to stage two. So stage two, now we're getting to the more advanced parts of your analytics journey. SQL will be the first hardcore skill that you need to learn and is a staple of any analyst toolkit. So SQL stands for Structured Querying Language, and it's the most standard method for retrieving data from databases. It's sort of a pseudo-programming language and is used by analysts at all kinds of companies to access the vast amounts of data stored in their databases. Why should you learn this? SQL is a standard tool used by many organizations, large and small, and most companies will store their data in databases. And although there might be tools that you can use to access a database without learning SQL, including Tableau, you'll drastically reduce the number of jobs you're eligible for by not learning SQL. At the end of the day, a lot of jobs require that you know SQL in order to apply for them, and that's why you should learn SQL. If you want to learn SQL, I have a free SQL in one hour course available over here. I promise people I'd make an advanced, so this is kind of like a beginner course. I promise people I'd make like an intermediate one, and I will. I promise I'll do it one day. Um, 
but we just got a lot of stuff we gotta get through, we gotta get through before that. And then an alternative resource is uh, Data Camp's Introduction to SQL, Kaggle's Intro to SQL, and Hacker Rank. Um, they have a bunch of SQL with SQL questions. The best thing I like about Data Camp, though, right, is that I have my uh, SQL in one hour course over here, but it's not a lot of practice in that. Data Camp has a bunch of practice problems, and you can download the app on your phone and practice even when you are um, not in front of your computer. Something I really recommend. Before we move on, I do want to show you what the practice on DataCamp looks like to show you what exactly you're getting if you decide to try it out. So I'm here on their uh, SQL course, and what we're doing right now is we are just doing a practice of group buys. Super simple. Basically, I'm going to select star from film so I can see which films are available. And then what they're telling me to do over here is to get the release year and count of films released per year. So release years over here. And then count of films released per year, that's probably just a count star statement. So what I'm going to do is I'll type in release, doing this all one-handed now, release year. And then we're going to do a simple count star uh, from films. We need to make sure that we group by release year. And I'm a huge proponent of actually practicing what you learn after you learn it. So my videos don't have practice problems, or they don't have that many, right? But there are tons of practice problems you can run over here. And I probably do need to name the column, right? Eh, they didn't say anything about that. That should be accurate. Let's see what we get. Might take a quick second. I don't know if it deleted my code or if it kept it. Cool. And looks like I got 25 XP points for that. So you have this like gamified way of like doing things. And the whole point of that is it's to keep you motivated and keep you doing more and more practice problems. So I just wanted to take a chance to show you guys how you can actually practice what you learn if you use DataCamp. All right, so you finished stage two where you've learned SQL. You've, you've gone through these courses, you've learned it, you know what you're doing. So now it's time to rise and grind. Grind session one. SQL doesn't lend itself particularly uh, to particularly interesting projects. They always say like make projects for data science and analytics. Um, that's kind of what you did over here with the BI tool. But SQL is kind of, it's kind of hard to do that with SQL quite honestly. And normally candidates will list SQL as a skill and then they'll just be tested at like the the company will just trust that you're not lying and they'll just test you on it in a technical interview. In a technical interview, someone, usually one of your future coworkers, will ask you to perform some data operations on a table. Even if you excel at the previous behavioral parts of, oh, I think I spelled excel wrong. I think I did, yeah. Even if you excel at the previous behavioral parts of the interview, if you fail the technical interview, you will most likely not be getting the job. The technical interview is incredibly important. We have, uh, uh, we have interviewed a lot of people. Um, and there are candidates who they did quite well in their behavioral part. They weren't like stellar, but they did like quite well in their behavioral part. But when we were talking about their technical part, all that had to happen was the technical interviewer just had to say, this person doesn't have the skills. We're not going forward with this person. The technical person, the technical interviewer has veto power because at the end of the day, uh, for more advanced jobs, if you just don't have the skills, you don't have the skills. It doesn't matter how great you are behaviorally. They can't really do much about it. So, um, Websites like DataCamp and HackerRank have a lot of questions you can use to practice your SQL. So practice, 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 and try and finish as many of these problems as you uh, can in, or sorry, try and finish as many of these as possible with daily practice. Understand that some companies, usually FANG companies, uh, the technical interview might be a bit harder than the actual work you end up doing for them. Um, I, I believe it was Facebook that kind of like popularized the modern um uh, comp side technical interview, which a lot of people have issues with, but at the end of the day, at least today, that is what people are using. And there is a good reason for it to some extent. Um, again, we've had people that told us they know SQL. And then when they come to the technical interview, they can't like, they can't do a simple group by statement. Um, so make sure that you learn the stuff and you practice, you know, I learned SQL, but until I practiced, I wasn't ready for an interview. All right. Stage three. We're almost there, guys. We're almost there. Almost at the end. Stage three objective. These skills can help take you can help take you to the next level, but aren't necessary for a lot of data analyst jobs. I highly recommend learning them, but you can you can be actively applying to jobs while learning these skills. So Python slash R. So what 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 is this? So Python and R are general purpose programming languages, and they've been adopted by all kinds of advanced analytic. Uh, data teams because of their ease of use, power, and robust libraries of data-centric functions. Everything from basic statistics to the most advanced machine learning libraries can be easily executed using R or Python. And why should you learn this? Although not required by all data analyst jobs, and it's less it's a less requested skill than SQL, 
Because Python slash R are general purpose programming languages, learning them unlocks a whole world of possibilities for your career. You'll be able to extract, transform, and load data using a single coding pipeline, automate data jobs, and analyze data using more advanced techniques than are available from a BI tool or Excel. I highly recommend these skills after you've finished all the previous green skills. I have my free Python bootcamp right over here. Check it out. It's on YouTube. Uh, and Kaggle and DataCamp have some of the best Python courses that I've seen. Um, I actually, I personally learned my Python skills from Kaggle. Kaggle is completely free. Go ahead and check it out. And uh, yeah, you can go check it out over there. Statistics. Okay, so statistics is a branch of mathematics that's concerned with using representative samples of a population in order to infer attributes of the overall population. Why should you learn this? Statistics is another skill that I don't specifically see outlined in a lot of data analyst job descriptions. And although I've used it in very limited quantities in my career, I believe that it's a good under that a good understanding of basic statistics as it relates to exploratory data analysis and hypothesis testing can really give your analyses that extra pop of insight. I would recommend learning this after you've picked up the other green and yellow skills. And I have chapter one of the book, Practical Statistics for Data Scientists over here, exploratory data analysis. And uh, it's it's one of the most, I didn't know this, but if you just type in practical data, or sorry, if you just type in practical statistics for data scientists in Google, uh, my video is like the first one that pops up. I was wondering why this video was so popular. Uh, and I'm guessing just no one created a version of this video prior. So I might go ahead and actually redo that video because it, it was shot very, very poorly. And I feel like I could do a better job, honestly. Uh, alternative resource, uh, introduction to statistics in Python through uh, DataCamp. All right, guys, so now you've finished stage three. We're gonna do project number two and grind session number two. Now that you've learned how to do more advanced analyses using tools like Python and R and some statistics, you'll need to do two things. A technical project that, uh, that demonstrates that you actually know what you're talking about and grind some Python and R problems to pass a technical interview. So because Python and R are general purpose programming, programming languages, the project possibilities with Python are endless and Python and R. But the most basic and simplest would be to take a data set from Kaggle.com and then create a Jupyter notebook of your analysis. This could demonstrate both your Python and R skills and how your statistical skills have developed as you craft a compelling and detailed narrative about the data set that you select. You'll also want to start practicing Python problems. Most Python slash R technical interviews at large companies will involve a, a number of data manipulations accomplished using pandas or tidyverse. As with SQL, daily practice is what keeps your skills sharp. If you want to uh, practice Python, then again, DataCamp, great resource. Lead code is also a good resource. Um, one thing I would also say is that um, if you are one of the, if you're going to join a smaller company, it's possible that they get a computer science or a computer engineer to, uh, sorry, a software engineer to interview you instead of a data analyst or data scientist. And if this happens, then you might actually get a more technical interview than you're expecting. So doing a little bit of lead code can be helpful over here. All right, so here is an example of a small project I did a couple of months ago on my YouTube channel. Go ahead and click it, check it out. All right, stage four, we are at the final stage. So either you're at, at stage four, you're either an experienced analyst or you have some free time on your hands following doing all the previous skills. And these are very much just additional skills that aren't necessary, but can propel your career forward into that senior analyst or to allow you to negotiate a much more lucrative pay package. And the three skills I have written over here are Git, project management, and machine learning. So machine learning, you know, uh, name for a group of mathematical and statistical data techniques that when combined with the power of computers can help take your analyses to the stratosphere in regards of impact. Um, I have a free course for machine learning over here and Kaggle has one of the best machine learning courses available and it's where I learned the basics of the, the science of machine learning. Um, I highly recommend it. Uh, we're not going to go into too much depth about that because th this is a skill that I think only after you've done everything else you should start looking into this. I will say though that um, even though data analysts themselves are typically not running machine learning pipelines, data analysts are oftentimes the glue that sticks together uh, both the business and the data scientists. In a lot of companies like Nordstrom, for example, we actually don't have BAs doing that work in analytics. Data scientists are, or data analysts are expected to do that, to do that work. And um, having an, a basic understanding of machine learning has helped me communicate with both business and data scientists. Project management. Um, this refers to all aspects of managing various stakeholders and technical experts in order to ensure everyone knows exactly what they're responsible for, when it's due, and managing their, abil their abilities against the expectation of executives and managers. Project managers, a good project manager is one of the most 
amazing people that anyone can have on a team. And I think that as you develop, if you want to get promoted, becoming good at project management is not just as a necessity. It well, is not just a option, it's a necessity. And I, I don't really have a resource on project management. Um, and if I find about any, if I find any like great like tutorials on becoming project, like becoming better at project management, I'll put, like put them over here. But I kind of find that they're like skills that people like pick up on the job as they get better. But uh, that's just something to like you know keep in mind, keep uh, on the lookout for. And then finally, Git. So also known as version control, Git is the industry standard way to maintain versions of code um, that you write and ensure that it is deployed to systems safely and thoroughly tested. This is also a more advanced skill, and as you work in organizations that have more advanced data implementations, analysts will be expected to write more and more of their own code. The only way to organize a large team of coders effectively is through some form of version control, which is where Git comes in. I currently don't have a resource on Git, but Luke Barus, the really popular data analyst YouTuber, um, and uh, guy makes funny videos, I love the guy, um, he has a video on GitHub, which is, in my opinion, one of his best videos. Um, he does an amazing job of keeping it casual while at the same time clearly explaining and showing you what Git is and how it works. So uh, his video is easily one of the best on YouTube. Highly recommend you check it out. And that is the Data Analyst Roadmap. Thank you guys so much for joining me. I know this is one of my most requested videos. I really hope that this is what you guys were looking for and this answers a lot of the questions that you might have about the world of analytics and how to break into it. I feel like I have a very thorough video over here and um, I'm very proud of the work I did over here. Remember, you can download this for free on Gumroad. If you would like to donate, it helps keep the channel up and running, and it's a great way to support the work that I do. Also, be sure to support our channel sponsor, DataCamp, by clicking on the link below. They, uh, You can check out the first chapter of any of their courses for free, and if you sign up, I get a bit of a commission on it too. It's a great way to support the channel and uh, help uh, keep me doing what I'm doing. But thank you guys so much for joining, and I hope you guys have a great day.